Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 353 of the Ortho Eval Pal podcast. I'm your host, Paul Marquis, and today we're going to be talking about tips for gaining functional knee extension after an ACL reconstruction. So we'll be talking about a case presentation today of a patient who's been having some difficulty getting that active last 10 to 20 degrees after ACLR. We're going to be talking about some of the causes of knee extensor lag, both passively and actively. And we're also going to be talking about some rehab tips to help maximize quad contractibility uh, and rehab extension and getting so much more. But before we get started, I'd like to mention our sponsor, Rangemaster. Now, Rangemaster is a company that carries many rehab tools. Some of you may already be using them. Everything from overhead pulleys to finger ladders to resistance bands and so much more. Now their newest product is awesome. It's called the Sling Thing Adapter. I've actually tried a few of them myself, and it's a great tool for patients recovering from shoulder surgery who have to wear a sling. Now, we know that if you fit a sling properly, it should put pressure near the neck uh, on the opposite side of the shoulder that's been surgically fixed. And uh, therefore, if it's placed right so that we can take pressure off that arm, you should feel some pressure in the neck. Well, unfortunately, that can become painful. And the Sling Thing Adapter was developed just to help relieve that discomfort comfort right there. So you basically put a strap on the contralateral side, tie it on, it pulls that neck piece away and it's all distributed throughout the good arm. Works very, very well. And if you're a medical provider working with orthopedic patients or patients who have had shoulder surgery, um, get your free sling thing by clicking the link in the show notes or by emailing jim at myrangemaster.com. All you have to do is add orthoevalpal in the subject line or use it as the coupon code and you won't regret it. Um, you're going to love this sling thing adapter. Now, into today's episode, um, we're going to be talking about a question that came from a listener. His name is Andy V. And his patient case scenario is this. And I'm just going to read it word for word as he sent it to me in the email. He says, I've got a patient who had a quad tendon autograph. She is between 12 to 14 weeks out, but struggled the first six weeks getting her quad firing and regaining extension and even having difficulty gaining flexion. They ended up doing a manipulation under anesthesia with a lysis of adhesions about four weeks ago. Her range of motion is now 0 to 120 degrees after stretching, but her gait is significantly flexed without terminal knee extension and with swing through lag. She has quad weakness and inhibition, and there is definitely an extensor lag with a straight leg raise. It seems no amount of NMES, retro treadmill walking, patella mobilizations, quad setting, TKE, or anything else that for that matter, that can get that quad firing. It seems like a clear neuromuscular issue to me, but I don't know how to break the cycle with all the things we've tried. Well, Andrew, I'm going to say you've really put a valiant effort into this young lady here um, because you've really done a lot of the the right things at the right time. Um, And so... These can be very, very frustrating, and I've had my share of them. I've treated hundreds and hundreds of ACL reconstruction patients, and it, this can be something that that we see on occasion, not always, but there are many different reasons why that can happen. So let's start with why someone might not get full extension passively. Even though that doesn't seem like this is the case here, I just want to rule that stuff out first, throw it out there for the rest of our listeners who may have patients who have a difficult time getting that extension passively. So number one, does the patient have swelling? We know that whenever you have swelling, it fills that capsule right up and then you end up in the loose pack position, which is about 20 to 25. I've even seen up to 30 degrees of knee flexion. Um, So if you took a normal knee that was in full extension, you injected uh, a bunch of fluid in there to mimic swelling, the knee would naturally want to migrate into flexion. So that is one reason why somebody may have some difficulty getting into passive extension, just becomes so tight, like a water balloon, uh, and squeezing that water balloon, you know, uh, on one side, the other side's going to get really tight, especially if you put more fluid into it. Um, They may have a posterior capsule tightness or some hamstring tightness that is not allowing that knee to get fully extended. You know, if people sleep in a flex position all night long, or some people will sleep with with a pillow under their knee and keep it flexed, and those tissues will get really tight, really stiff, and prevent that knee from passively going into extension. Now, we could have a ligament placement issue, you know, from surgery. This doesn't happen very often, but 
typically they will put that ligament in, they'll test the patient out, they'll bring them through full range of motion. So that's usually not the case. But where we could have trouble soon after surgery is um, a cyclops lesion, where somebody could develop scar tissue around that that uh, you know that footprint where the ACL is in the tibia and even in the femur. It scars up, so you lose that ability to fully extend because that, that ACL needs to straighten out all the way, but if it's full of scar tissue around there, it just doesn't allow it to do that. And therefore, the patient, you can push on him and push on him for half an hour to try to gain extension, and it keeps popping back up. Most oftentimes, they'll have pain, and they'll complain of it like right in the front of the knee, like behind the patella between that, that tibiofemoral joint, um, and that's where you get most discomfort from a cyclops lesion. I assume that if this patient had one, it was removed with the lysis of adhesions, um, but I don't have that information. So we'll just assume that, you know, we had some capsular stiffness uh, in there and uh, that was an issue. So now let's say that they have good passive range of motion, but they have difficulty gaining active extension of the knee. Okay, usually it's that last 10 to 20 degrees that could be the hardest. So what could be going on here? Well, first things first, it's very likely that the patient would have reflex inhibition, okay? So basically the quad is shutting down because there is pain, because there is swelling, or there's a sense of instability. So, and some people have all three of these, and so therefore just can't get that quad turned on very well at that end range. Um, now the patient could have kinesiophobia, simply, you know, just the fear of the knee being unstable and going into hyperextension can cause them to stay in that semi-flex position because the quads and the hamstrings together in that position are very efficient and mechanically help to hold the knee a little more stable and therefore they like to be in that semi-flex position. Now, the next issue we could see here is that you know, maybe this person has some secondary gain, and I'm not saying that she does, um, but I have seen cases like this where maybe an athlete doesn't want to play sports, but there's pressure from the parents to play, uh, or from coaches or teammates, um, and they just don't want to do that. Or it could be other activities like dance or, or whatever else it might be that requires, uh, you know, being physically active. And so some people will kind of, you know, slow things down a little bit. And, and because they have that flex knee, it's recognized that there's still something wrong there. Um, and so this is very difficult to fix. It does require a conversation. If you think this is happening, you have to have a conversation with this person in, in, in a frank conversation. And if she's you know, not old enough, then talking to the parents, uh, bringing them in on this and saying, listen, we have this issue here. We, we need this knee to be fully extended so that she functions well in the future. We just want to make sure that, you know, everything is going well. Are you happy with your therapy? And, and oftentimes, you know, something might come out where they say, well, you know, there's something else going on here. Um, and so that could be an issue also. Um, you know, I, I explained to them that it's very important that we get to that full extension so that they have a good functional leg and a good quad contraction, no patellofemoral dysfunction, don't really want to scare them, but these are things that happen when you don't have full extension in the future. So, you know, let's say that this is strictly physical though, okay? So this young lady that, um, that we have here just physically cannot extend the knee past, you know, that last 10 to 20 degrees of extension. If there is still swelling there, you got to get rid of it, okay? So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories can help. <clears throat> I like compression sleeves. Uh, I use compression sleeves on a lot of my patients. I find that not only does it help to get rid of their swelling in their knee, but it also helps to build proprioception because they're getting that total contact around the quad, uh, the anterior lateral and posterior medial side of the knee and around uh, the thigh and around the calf. And I think that really helps with the proprioception. They have a little bit better sense of stability even though it's not a stabilizing brace. But the proprioceptive aspect of it I think is more important. Now, if you're going to use NMES, I think that's a great modality. Oftentimes, we just use that in the clinic. But if you feel like they have some benefit using it in the clinic, there is nothing wrong with doing it on a daily basis, maybe at home, maybe a couple of times a day, if you feel like that's really making a big difference. What I like to use before trying NMES is biofeedback, though. I find this to be 
so much more effective because that patient will get a better quad contraction because they can see how well they're contracting. Maybe start with it on the good leg, show them what they're getting um, as far as numbers go, and then put it on the affected leg and have them take a look at that. Then you can do some different techniques to help try to optimize that or get that to beep a little bit better or to get those bars a little bit higher or to meet those goals that you set. Um, but it's a very goal-oriented thing. Getting that feedback immediately is a very very, very helpful in understanding how to contract that quad. And some people just don't know how to do it very well. Um, it might be putting a small roll under their knee to get them to push into something. I try to pull that roll out from under their knee while they're doing a quad set. I'm like, don't let me pull it out. And so I have them try to hold it there. I might do some patella facilitation and some, some stretch reflex type techniques to help them contract that quad a little bit better. Um, you can't use a massage gun with the biofeedback on because the uh, vibration will cause uh, the biofeedback to kick in. But if you're not using the biofeedback, then something like uh, tapping, facilitatory tapping, massage, uh, a massage gun or even high vibration uh, tools can help to get that quad to fire up a little bit. Now. The next thing I like to do is get them into open chain terminal knee extensions. Now I know that there's been a lot of, you know, I've been at this for 33, 32 years and there was a time for about 25 years where they were saying, well, if you do open chain knee extensions, you're going to stretch that ACL ligament. And we found out very early in this whole process when this research uh, had come out that patients were developing a lot of anterior knee pain because their quads were not firing very well. And at what expense? Like I had never seen anybody have a stretched out ACL or increased instability because we were doing open chain knee extensions and we were doing a lot of them. We still do a lot of them and we've continued to do open chain knee extensions. We just might go with a little lighter weight and that really helps them to get that leg extended. Um, we might even do it with blood flow restriction training so that you don't have to load the leg with such a heavy load. You can do it with really lightweight and still get the effects. Um, so I'm big on short arc quads, long arc quads after ACL reconstruction just to get that, that quad turned on better. They understand that if, they, if the knee is on something and you're trying to pick that foot up toward the ceiling, they understand what they have to do there. Whereas doing a quad set could be somewhat challenging for some people sometimes. Then I'll take them from that open chain, bring them into standing, do some close kinetic chain terminal knee extension exercises with that band behind the knee while the band is tied to a pole or something like that in front of them. And what I do here is I really have them focus on squatting down with both legs at the same time, like pretending they're gonna sit on their heels. They stand back up, they squeeze the glutes together first, and then they contract the quad. And by doing that, you take the, um, the glute max kind of out of the picture of doing extension, okay, and to not compensate, and then the quad will have to work a little bit harder to get into extension. Um, from there, I might put them onto a leg press, a shuttle, cardiomuscular trainer. I'll get them doing some single-legged uh, stance exercises and try to get them at that 10 degree, five degree mark. I'll put my hand in, in front of the knee and in back of the knee, and I'll have them try to get up to zero. And they may feel a little bit wobbly, but that's okay, okay? Just tell them that you're gonna be supporting them in case it does go in any direction and just get them comfortable with that, with some sort of weight bearing close to extension. Um, and that, then they'll build that confidence. And really, you as a therapist need to be a, a cheerleader and you know cheer them on, get them going, build that confidence so that they feel a little bit more comfortable. Now, let's say that the patient comes into the clinic every time and they have this lack of extension, both actively and passively. They wake up in the morning, they're really stiff. You know, maybe they're just somebody who produces a lot of scar tissue, okay? Maybe they're predisposed to things like adhesive capsulitis or do Poitrin's contractures. Maybe there's a family history. It could be hereditary. We've seen this. And they just stiffen up and lay down a lot of scar tissue. Well, you know, if they're flexed at night and we find that that is a problem trying to get extended again, uh, you know, using something like, and I don't like to use this, but... Um, except for in this case, would be a knee immobilizer to keep that leg nice and straight. Or you could get into something like a Dynasplint that, ha that is spring-loaded, it's a very light spring, and it's a comfortable brace, and it pushes the leg into extension 
very, very low load for a long period of time. They can wear it through the night, um, and it's extremely low load, but it keeps pushing into extension lightly, um, and that could be, you know, helpful. Now, you need to think outside of the box now just to make sure that something else hasn't gone wrong, like, you know, like a quad tear or something like that. If the patient is a little bit older and they've torn their ACL, could there be something else going on here? That would have been recognized, you know, if they did the quad tendon, so I don't think that's the case here. And another one that would be super rare might be like an L3 nerve root compression. Um, again, We've seen people, I've seen lots of people L3 nerve root compression, they have significant loss of knee extension. And so that is something else that's going on, that could be going on there. You might want to do a lumbar screen, okay? Just do the, test their reflexes, sensation, distal muscle strength, see if there's anything else going on there. And it doesn't take a long time to put somebody through a myelopathic screening, like a Hoffman's test, Babinski, check if they have clonus, are they hyper-reflexive when you check their reflexes. There might be an underlying, you know, upper motor neuron lesion going on here. If you're suspicious of that, then send the patient for an EMG. And if the patient has full extension passively and just can't extend it actively, maybe an EMG is in order anyway, okay? Just to see if there's something else that could be going on here that could, you know, hold that leg from going into full extension. So those are my thoughts, Andrew. I hope that um, you can get this young lady to full active extension soon. I hope that maybe I threw a few ideas out there that you can take back to the clinic and uh, try with your patient to see if, you know, maybe we can uh, get her to gain this extension back. But I think, you know, we have to be patient with some of these. I've seen some of these take six to eight months before they can get that full extension. Um, it's very frustrating, but you just want to make sure you don't lose it passively also because they may be scarring down again. There may be something else going on there. So, so um, if anybody here is listening and they have other ideas for Andrew, send me an email or send me a fan mail text, okay? That link is right at the top of the show notes and it's very easy to do. It allows you to send me a text through that um, and um, I can't respond to you, but I could certainly do it in another show or I could forward that information to Andrew and give him that information because really we're all here to help each other out, right? So if uh, you have any other patient scenarios you want to bring to me to put on the show, I'd be more than happy to bring it on and uh, you know really try to help you folks get a better idea on how to manage those cases, those difficult cases a little bit better. So um, again, thank you all for listening. Uh, so kind of you to be there for me and it's you know I've been 353 episodes I'm super stoked that I can continue to do this there's so much in my head that I want to take out and put into a podcast so I plan on continuing to do it and uh, until next time be kind to each other and take care